We have Master Maggie Cole Messina. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me. It's a long trip from Long Island, huh? Not too bad, but yeah, it's a long trip, six hours. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure having you. And, and you come to us by way of your brother, Lee Cole. Shout out to Lee Cole. And, you know, Lee was mentioning that you have, you know, a phenomenal background. And it, it, it started uh, in the foster care system. And you grew up with 11 siblings. Um, and you were the six of the 11. And so life started off rough for you. In the cards, you, you, there wasn't much opportunity presented to you. Can you speak a little bit about the foster care system and, and some of the terrible things you had to experience? Yeah, in 1972, uh, on Valentine's Day, uh, we were taken from our homes um, and uh, put into foster care because uh, my dad had gone to jail and uh, my mom didn't, didn't return home for several weeks. So we were put into foster care for several years. And unfortunately, uh, you know, there was a lot of abuse and um, what I would call torture during those years that we suffered, um, which my twin brother Danny and I uh, had um, landed in one particular foster home in Yorktown Heights. And uh, we, saw, we endured torture and neglect and uh, verbal abuse to sexual abuse. Um, yeah. And you, you mentioned sadistic things, being thrown into a pool, being tied to a leash, things that are hard for a lot of people to imagine, Master Maggie. Uh, and during that time, did you ask yourself, why is this happening to me? Um, you know, I never asked the why. I was in survival mode. Um, a lot of the, the years in those, that particular Forrester home, I spent a lot of my time disassociating from the situation. So I was there, but I wasn't there. And that's something I taught myself to do because it was just so big. The, the abuse was so great. Um, unfortunately, there are things that I do remember and, um, you know, uh, yeah, I ask myself every day, how can people treat children of five, six, seven year old, that age of, or of any age in that manner, um, in such a, a horrible way, especially when you're there to, uh, you're supposed to provide love and care for children that were taken out of their initial home. Um, and later on in life, I think what happens is it hits you even more. And, um, as you have your own children and, um, the pain and what was inflicted on you, it, you, you realize just how great it is. Um, but back then, uh, you know, I was never one to feel sorry for myself or ask why it was happening. All I knew is it was happening and I had to find a way to escape. So escaping by, by um, disassociating, not realizing what I was doing back then, only in later in life when I entered therapy and um, treatment to try to uh, find a way to live and um, continue to breathe and uh, in life. Right. And unfortunately, your twin brother, Danny, passed away in 2018 of an overdose. Yeah. May God rest his soul. And, and it's hard to imagine the devastation that the foster system seems to produce. Well, you know, if I, I will say one thing that I ask myself today and I live with today is that I say, OK, if it was an isolated event and it happened to me and the system got better and things are different, I could probably be okay somewhat with that, but it's not any better. It's it's just as bad, if not worse. And children are being put into these homes. These people are, are intentionally taking children into their homes for solely for the money, and um, they're not being cared for. And not only not cared for, but they're being severely abused. And, um, you know, of course, the social workers are blamed, but I don't believe that the social worker is the person to blame because... You know, they're giving such a large caseload of 30 children. How do you get to everyone? How? And not only that, you have a type of parent like my mom that is a very vulgar and, and just not a nice person 
that will shut that door right in your face and, and make threats to you and your personal life that is very scary for people. So it kind of cripples them from doing their job. Um, I will, I do want to mention too, which is, um, you know, it's the hierarchy on at, of the forced care system. It's the hierarchy up on top. They need to do more and they need to make it where people that are servicing these homes, these social workers that are going into these homes have better tools and better equipped and are not so overworked and overwhelmed. I mean, and that's the, that's what no one really wants to talk about. You know, people don't want to look at that. And I am, I am, I, I, I've been there. I've been through it as a child. I've lost three of my siblings because of the things that we had to endure as children that they could not live through. And because the foster care system found it easier to return us to our parents than to try to find 10 more homes. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's a, a, a big, it's a snowball that continues to get bigger and bigger. And, you know, the people up on top are not doing what they need to do to make it better. And in children are dying and uh, they're dying. And it, it's just it, the one thing that really hurts me the most is to watch it continue to happen. And, uh, you know, we have to do something to change it. And I find that people like myself that have been through it, I know what that pain feels like. I know what it feels like when you're being abused by someone and that social worker shows up and you're, you're threatened that your life, I will kill you if you say anything and how that feels as a child firsthand. And there are children in this world today that are living through these circumstances today. And I can spot them a, a mile away. I could spot it like that. So what's the problem? You know, why are so many people taking the, making the choice to look away and act as if it's not happening? Because the end result is not when we leave those foster care, that foster care home and go home or go to a different one. It could be the greatest foster home that we're given, we're put into after the abuse. But that abuse does not go away. It only rises as we become adults. I lost my twin brother, my my little sister Alice and my brother Tommy, all at the age of 50, 51. And um, it has to do with the, the abuse that we suffered early on and they were not able to see themselves as people in the world that, that were smart and able to live amongst others. And um, they greatly suffered through their their lives as they try to find a path that they just never felt comfortable on. And, and that's the crime in it because you can turn away and say, okay, the child's out of the home, but the child's not out of that home. That home will fo follow that person for the rest of their lives. Is there a lack of oversight and who, who regulates the foster care system in, in New York? I guess you could speak for New York. I would say the the uh, the um, the state and uh, the child care services. I think who's ever regulating it isn't doing doing a very good job, which is very obvious. It's a sad thing for me to say, and it breaks my heart. But I do feel that there's a part of society that thinks that feels like there's there's certain people such as the white poor trash they call us and called us as kids that we're disposable as if we don't matter. And um, there's a, a whole group of upstate New Yorkers that are poor and white. And when you're growing up in that type of environment, there is a level of mental illness that is so profound that the people, the children growing up in this, in, in, in this, I want to call sewer, are so greatly affected on so many levels. I, I personally grew up thinking I was stupid and that I could, I wasn't smart enough. I, I you know, there were times when I would sit and take a test at school and put the opposite answers because I, I was so brainwashed and so taught that I was dumb that 
I didn't even believe my own strengths. And I am one of the lucky ones because I, I found treatment. I found the people in my life. I had someone in my life that was there to plant the seed that, you know what? You're not what people say. You're smart. You can do anything you want, but you just have to find that way. And because of that, I trudged, I trudged my way. I mean, I had my moments where I suffered from addiction and um, I fell into the, those, you know, dark places, but I had a tenacity that I was born with. I just kept getting back up. Whereas not everyone has that, maybe the 1%. And um, unfortunately, the, the people who don't have that are the ones that OD on drugs and take their lives. And to, for me to have three of my siblings, lose three of them in such a short period of time from 20, late 20, December 2018 to 2021, and um, is, is just life-changing. And I know that my mission here is to be a part of the change that has to happen. This is Maggie Messina on Cinemills TV. Don't forget to hit that like button. Master Maggie, you mentioned sexual abuse and we don't want to dig up old bones, but did that affect how you interacted with men later on in your life? Did you kind of hate men for a great period of your life? Um, absolutely. I, you know, it affected my ability with intimacy um, and how I felt about um, uh, sex. Um, I always, you know, viewed it from a perspective of a dirty thing. It's something wrong. It's, it's not something that's good. <laughs> and uh, that is definitely stemmed from my upbringing, the abuse that I suffered. Um, and it also affected the way and the men I picked and how I allowed them to treat me. And it took me, it took me into my mid thirties to believe that I do, uh, I do believe, I do uh, uh, deserve to be treated a certain way. And that was only after a lot of therapy and, um, uh, you know, working it out, going through it. Right. Um, it's not something that, you know, one day you just wake up and say, oh, I, I deserve to be treated, you know, you know, nicely and I deserve that nice guy. No, it's, it requires you to work on yourself and um, uh, to, to face that devil that is hindering behind you because of the trauma that we suffer as children. It, it's a journey that um, very few are willing to take because it's the hardest. Some people ask me, what was your, what, who was your hardest opponent as a fighter? And my answer is myself, mm. my inner, my inner being was my hardest opponent. And um, because that's the one I wanted to get away from. No one wants to face that pain and to uh, relive any of that, but it's necessary. It's imperative in order to become the person you deserve to be. Right. And, you know, we're all fighting those inner demons and, you know, we go back to the old Chinese, you know, adage about there's two dogs that live within us. One is an evil and mean dog. The other is benevolent, sweet and nice. And the question is, which dog wins the war? And Absolutely. It, it typically is the one you feed, right? Absolutely. You know, I went through a period of time where I thought that there was this magic pill, this magic potion or something, some therapist or, or treatment was going to free me of it all. But at the end of the day, there is no magic pill, magic treatment. Nothing's going to free you but yourself. So it's an inside job, basically. Absolutely. Okay. Master Maggie, you, you're an eighth degree black belt and and you recently got your eighth degree black belt and you know this is this is taekwondo this is the real thing and taekwondo has always had a very strong youth 
base here in America, and I know Korea, where it originates from, is is it's a national sport. How important was martial arts towards steering you the right direction? Martial arts saved my life. Um, without it, I'm not sure where I would be. It was the one place that I can go to and practice and uh, learn and be where there were there wasn't any drinking and drugs. It kept me off the streets. And, um, you know, I'm an, I was always an athlete. I love working out. I love uh, challenging my physical abilities. And it was just the right place for me. And um, when I was about a brown belt, I knew that I was going to do this for my living. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach martial arts. I'm going to have my own school. But most importantly, I'm going to do it differently. I'm not going to, you know, um, I, I didn't see myself doing it like everybody at the time was doing it. They were just teaching martial arts and um, there was a lot of ego involved. Uh, you know, women weren't being treated the way we should be treated. And, you know, we, we put up with a lot. You know, I put up with a lot that I should not have put up with. And um, I, made it my, uh, my own, I promised myself, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it differently. I did what I had to do. I went to night school um, to get my degree in teaching um, early childhood children to help understand how to educate them and how their learning process is as far as cognitive behavior, so on and so forth. So, and I, what I, basically what I did was I, 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 um, kind of like weaponize myself to be the best at it. So you can you can be a martial artist and you can teach martial arts, but that doesn't make you a great teacher. It doesn't make you a good mentor. It doesn't make you um, a leader. It, it The things that make you all those other things is what you're willing to do and and how, how the sacrifices you're willing to take and give and the, how you're willing to educate yourself and spend money on educating yourself to bring you to the higher level. And my, my, my journey is always about bettering the person from the inside out. The kicking and punching comes secondary. It's what are we doing for these children today? And, you know, what, what kind of seed are we planting in them? You know, um, in today's society, unfortunately, everyone, everyone wants to be everyone's friends. And sometimes parents, as parents, we get trapped in that and we want to be our child's friends. And... And when we get stuck in that path, we get stuck on that journey. We forget that, you know, you're the parent, you're, you're the educator of this child. You're going to teach them how to be in the world and how to protect themselves. And sometimes we get lost and the child becomes I kind of, you know, I don't want it to come off, you know, saying this incorrectly, but there's really no other way to say it. You know, our children become soft, they become spoiled. And they think that they can change the rules and they can change the laws and they can do anything they want the way they want to do it. And, you know, that's not reality, okay? Um, there's something called respect, respecting themselves and respecting others and um, doing things ethically and uh, not selling your soul along the way. And I think that has really gotten lost. It's become a huge issue. We're nerfing Major. our society. We're, we're, everyone gets a participation trophy and, and it's teaching kids that there's all these winners and there's no losers, losers, but in life, and you're in, you're a living example of that. There's winners and there's losers. And, you know, I will say from my own personal experience, I don't learn when I win. I learn when I lose. Because now I have to go back to the drawing board and I have to have a conversation with my emotions and how I handled that loss and what I need to do to strengthen the tools that failed me. And that is the greatest time in my life is when I lose. We need to learn how to lose, not teach our children it's all about winning. And it's, it's okay to lose, you know, that's where the lesson is. And it's so imperative that we not lose sight of that. The first thing when we met, you 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 brought your grandmaster, uh, 
Sa Chong Kang up and you showed respect to that man and the lineage is carrying on through you at, at, at your dojo. I mean, this is a man that gave me the life I have today. If not for him, I would not have met his son, Grandmaster Tai Sung Kong. And I would not have the life I have. And it's not okay to, you know, pretend that that's not important. It's very important. Um, and I think what's happening is that, you know, as mentors, we, we help groom people. We help them, you know, plant the seeds that are necessary. And as mentors, we give selflessly. We give without expecting anything in return, at least for myself. The only thing I expect is for you to do the best you can to be a good, kind person in the world. I don't give you because I expect you to give me something back. That's never been the way I operate, and it's not the way I live my life. It's not involved in my values. The problem is, is I think that people forget that, and they start to believe that they create it themselves. None of us create ourselves by ourselves. We are creation, we are a creation of the village that helps raise us. And that's not one parent, that's not two parents, it's the village that raises us. And it's so unfortunate to see that that has become, become lost at the wayside. And without that, no one will ever be their full potential. Yes, without a doubt, you know, your journey through, through martial arts has created quite the resume. and. Recently, this year, you you got a lifetime achievement award for volunteering from Joe Biden, President Biden, and it's hard to imagine that little Maggie, who grew up in the foster care system, could become an eighth degree black belt, have a functioning, high level, popular dojo in Long Island and Albertson, New York, and receive an award from the president of the greatest nation in the world. Did you ever think this would happen to you, Master no. Maggie? <laughs> no, I, I, receiving that award was so tremendous that I barely stopped to digest it. And one day I was standing in my, uh, in, in my school, uh, um, at, at the Dochang we call it, and I saw it on the wall and I had to say, remind myself like, wow, only 100 people to this date have received this award. And um, I, you know, I had to really stop and pinch myself because I'm, I've always, I've, I'm always on a mission to just make the wrongs right. Right the wrongs wherever and however I can for someone else. And um, these are just the things that happen along the way you know, people do stop and appreciate what you're doing. So those of us, you know, there are people that are constantly doing good things in the world and trying to make the change and they feel unappreciated. The whole thing is not to do it to be appreciated. Do it because it's the right thing and you, it, because it's your mission. And then all of those things come. So um, yeah, it was an amazing award. It was just amazing. And my eighth Dan, um, that was full circle for me because the gentleman, great, great grandmaster Kong, who, who promoted me was the youngest son of my great grandmaster. And, um, when he promoted me, I had to look back because he was my teacher. And at one time he, he told me I would never become the person I am today. And, um, I'm not saying that he looked me right in the face and said it, but actions speak louder than words. So to have him promote me and have him give me that credibility was a real wow factor. For five minutes, it was the happiest, most accomplished moment in my life. What's next for you, Master Maggie? We know this, the, the Tay Cole School is, is doing very well. And it's, it's in an it's in a area that, you know, uh, is a high-end area. It's, it's high net worth. Uh, client base do you do you work with foster children that might not have the means to afford the dues? i do i do work with all walks of life you know um and i do i do give there are children that come to my school and i give them scholarships they don't pay tuition um during the pandemic i uh you know a lot of our families as well as off as they are but doctors and lawyers they they weren't able to practice 
and um, they had to shut down their practices and they had no income coming in. And, um, you know, where I, I could not say to them, OK, you can't come, you can't pay, you can't come. I let, had half of my population come in for free. And when I tell you during the pandemic, I, the money that wasn't coming in um, and not able to pay my mortgage, I put myself second. I didn't pay myself. All my staff got paid. They got their um, medical benefits still. And um, I took care of the school. That was my priorities to make sure the kids were okay and they had an outlet where um, they weren't in the home suffering, you know, uh, more emotionally than they had to. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I could never turn someone that's suffering away. And especially because it's the best thing and it's the best place. Yeah. I've created a safe haven that yeah. I, if I had as a child, it would have made a whole difference it in my have life. Changed your, your, Absolutely. Yeah. And that was my reason for creating Take Whole. It wasn't about making money. It never has been. It's about creating something greater for children to where they can go and develop and become the best person they can be. Right. And you've created not only a safe environment for children of all backgrounds, but you've also made them safer people in a very violent and cold, dying world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, besides the, the actual physicality, the technique, the forms, what are you teaching these kids? What, what is your, your greatest advice you depart to these young kids as to have self-confidence and is there, is there something that you tell these kids? Every child, I, I, I let them know that we can become anything we desire in life, but there's requirements and there's no skipping the line. It requires hard work, dedication, and it requires getting your feelings hurt. It requires um, failing and learning the lessons. Um, as as young 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 as young children, they told us nothing comes for free. Of course, with a different choice word, shit doesn't come for free. And um, what they don't they don't just mean that from a financial background. Nothing comes for free without the lessons. And um, to stay honest and someone of integrity, um, there's a lot of skip in the line. Everybody thinks they could skip the line and that they're going to be more successful than the next guy because I got there first. No, we, we, we're built from the inside out and uh, you can do, become, like I said, you become anything you want, but it's the how in what we do, not right. what we do. It's the how in how we get there, not that we get there. It's the journey in between that is everything. And we were talking about this. There's a big scandal. It's been an ongoing thing in martial arts where this concept of the celebrity black belt, the, the quick handout of a black belt that's not properly earned. They didn't climb every ugly rung, but because they have some notoriety, a, a grandmaster or a sensei is, or a shihan is handing out a black belt. Your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts are it's what it's doing is it, it's taking the integrity, it's taking everything away from the people who work it took me 40 years to get my eighth degree black belt. 40 years. 40 years, just about 40 years, a little shy of 40 years. I feel proud, but other people will even look at someone like me and say, it's not, she's not really an eighth degree. Somebody, you know, she just bought it from someone. So it, it, it takes the value away from the people like myself and other people in the, in the martial arts that dedicate their whole entire lives to get that type of rank. And, it, you know, here we go again, skipping the line. It's a nice gesture, but it's not real. <laughs> you know, it's, and personally, I, I don't think it's okay. No, I don't think it's okay. I mean, um, you're an honorary 10th degree black belt because you know so-and-so and whatever charity you give to. I mean, can you really look at yourself in the mirror and put that belt around your waist and believe the lie. And I, I think what's most important is that, you know, it's um, what you're doing to the whole meaning behind becoming a black belt and being someone of, of, of such a high stature and what you're taking away from it by not being that, that person.
Master Maggie, it seems like the martial arts community goes and just like fashion, there's different trends. One minute this is in and that's in and jujitsu's hot right now. And then it was Muay Thai and karate was, was big. But could you explain to our audience, Taekwondo, would you consider the art 50% leg kicks, 50% strikes? Now, one thing about Taekwondo is that everybody needs to understand Taekwondo, there's Olympian Taekwondo, which they use a lot of legs and it's sport oriented. Okay. Then there's the other Taekwondo, like the, uh, the ITF Taekwondo, uh, Kuki Kwan and, um, Kuk Mu Kwan. And that is the art form. That is what was taught to the military. They use this, this is block to break, strike to kill. This is not a sport. This is an art form and it's a no nonsense. And um, Taekwondo, the Taekwondo I study, the art form is 50% hands, 50% feet, and you better block. So it's not just about bringing these kicks up and you're just doing this. No, that's the sport. So, and what happens is that when some people hear, oh, you do Taekwondo, right away they're judgmental, like, oh, you do that stuff, that's not real fighting. And that's just, you know, you're just tagging each other or whatever. No, it's the art form that I practice. So Master Maggie, you know, you, you mentioned the point fighting system versus, you know, the hardcore Taekwondo. Um, what are what are your your kind of thoughts of, in, as it relates to combat style self-defense? Are you also teaching that at Take Hold? Oh, absolutely. Okay. That's that's what I teach okay. self-defense. So it's like I had said earlier, it's block to break, strike to kill. And, um, you know, it sounds kind of harsh, but, you know, when you go to a martial arts school, what are you going there for? You're, right. you're going there to learn how to defend yourself and to react when you need to react. Sure. So it's a built into your DNA. And uh, that's why it's important to con continue to go to class and continue to, you know, repetition. Right. Any plans for take hold here in the West Coast? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, I can recreate myself anywhere. I have no doubt of that. Um, but there's only so much of me to go around. So, um, yeah, but, uh, how can our audience get in touch with you? Do you have like an Instagram and do you kind of mentor other, other people that are looking to get absolutely. into the sport? Absolutely. You can uh, contact me on, uh, at Maggie Messina, um, on Facebook and Instagram. You can also contact me at, uh, 516-739-7699. Very cool. Or just Google me on social media. Nice. Basically, yeah. Master Maggie, thank you so much My for pleasure. coming through thank today. Thank you. Thank you.